In our last lesson on enzyme kinetics and inhibition from Chapter 7, we want to look at allosteric regulation and briefly summarize some of the cellular methods for regulating enzyme activity. In allosteric regulation, a ligand binds to a site other than the active site. Allo means other, and this binding can either inhibit or activate the enzyme. In other words, the binding of a ligand to a site other than the active site influences what occurs within that active site. Let's look at the example of phosphofructokinase. It catalyzes the conversion of fructose 6-phosphate to fructose 1,6-bisphosphate, as illustrated at the bottom of the slide here. As you can see, it transfers a phosphoryl group from ATP to that number one position to form the bisphosphate product. This is an important step in glycolysis, as we'll examine in more detail later in the semester, and therefore it is highly regulated. It is allosterically inhibited by phosphoenolpyruvate, or PEP. The structure is shown at the top of the slide here. It's not important you memorize the structure, simply that you remember its effect on the enzyme. It is one of the end products of the glycolytic pathway, and that's illustrated at the bottom of the slide here. In glycolysis, we start with the substrate glucose, and through a series of 10 steps, we form the ultimate end product, which is pyruvate. The product of the ninth step in that pathway is PEP. So not the ultimate end product, but certainly an end product of that pathway. As the concentration of PEP increases, it binds to phosphofructokinase and inhibits its activity. And that's illustrated by our traffic signal colors here, red indicating stop or inhibition. In other words, the product of the pathway feeds back to an earlier step in the pathway to inhibit that enzyme, that step. In essence, the pathway shuts itself down. Let's think for a moment of the logic of that. If PEP concentration is increasing, that can only occur if the cell is not utilizing that product. If the cell is not using the product of the pathway, why continue to generate more of that product? And so, as the product concentration increases, it shuts down its own synthesis. Phosphofructokinase is actually a dimer of dimers. The active site residues are contributed from both dimers. In our illustration here, our ribbon diagram, blue would be one dimer and the purple the other dimer. Let's look at the enzyme activity of phosphofructokinase in the absence and presence of PEP. Here we have a substrate saturation curve. Our substrate concentration is fructose 6-phosphate on the x-axis, increasing from left to right. And we have the velocity on the y-axis. In this case, we've normalized the initial velocity by dividing that by the Vmax, but it is in essence a substrate saturation curve. Let's look first at that green trace, which represents the activity of the enzyme in the absence of PEP. As you can see, it's a hyperbolic plot, which means it obeys michaelis menten kinetics. And if you look at that halfway point, our dashed line here, we have a very low Km, indicating a high affinity for substrate. However, in the presence of PEP, that's our red trace here, we reach the same saturation point, but look how much higher that Km value. Again, that's our dashed line at that halfway point. A much larger Km indicates a much reduced affinity for that substrate. You'll notice also the shape of the curve has changed. It is no longer hyperbolic, it is now sigmoidal, and that is the hallmark for an allosteric enzyme or allosteric regulation. Let's distinguish for a moment between allosteric activity and allosteric regulation. An allosteric enzyme is one that binds its substrate allosterically always. There's always a cooperativity of substrate binding, and this is illustrated in the substrate saturation plots as illustrated here. 
When we plot velocity as a function of substrate concentration, the shape of the curve is always sigmoid, so the enzyme always has allosteric activity. However, in this example with PFK, the activity changed in the presence of an effector. That effector could be positive in the case of an activator or negative in the case of an inhibitor. So it's the presence of the effector that produces the sigmoidal plot and that tells us it's allosteric regulation. In other words, the enzyme does not have inherent allosteric activity. Let's take a little closer look at what's occurring within that active site in response to PEP binding. Here we have a backbone trace of phosphofructokinase in its activated form, that's the green trace, and in the inhibited form, that's the red trace. Let's look at the green first. You'll notice there's an arginine residue in the active site and of course that's going to carry a positive charge. This is perfect for binding the substrate, fructose 6-phosphate, which carries a negative charge. In other words, there's an ionic interaction, an attraction, between that arginine residue and the substrate. I would point out another residue, and that's a glutamate residue here, that carries a negative charge. You'll notice it is not in that active site. Let's see what happens when PEP binds. Here's PEP on the right. It's binding somewhere other than the active site and it's going to change the conformation of the enzyme. What will be the response within that active site? As you can see, the arginine residue carrying the positive charge has been flipped out of the active site and the glutamate residue carrying the negative charge has flipped in. So now, instead of an active site positive charge, we have an active site negative charge. Instead of binding the substrate, it will repel the substrate. So here is a, an excellent example of how an allosteric effector can bind other than the active site and yet influence what's occurring within that site. So phosphoenopyruvate affects the substrate binding in an adjacent active site and of course it's a negative effector and so it's an allosteric inhibitor. In the case of PFK, phosphofructokinase, it's actually allosterically activated by another metabolite, adenosine diphosphate or ADP, positively affected by that. Again, a very highly regulated enzyme. Let's briefly summarize some of the methods the cell has for regulating enzyme activity. First of all, number one, the most fundamental way is simply to change the rate of synthesis and degradation of the enzyme. And that's illustrated by number one here. In other words, how much of the enzyme is actually present in the cell. A second way that we could regulate enzyme activity, and that's illustrated by number two here, we could have a concentration of the enzyme and yet we could sequester it in a vesicle so that it would be inactive in that location. And then when we're ready for that enzyme for do, to do its job, we can relocate it where we need it to work. In our third case here, the enzyme could be present within the cell but inactive until it's activated by, by some ionic signal, I, either a change in pH or a change in ion concentration such as calcium. Lastly, and perhaps most commonly, we can regulate enzyme activity by covalent modification. In other words, we can add a group to activate or deactivate the enzyme, and then we simply remove the group to reverse the effect, and that's illustrated by number four here. The most common group transfer is that phosphoryl group transfer. That concludes our studies for Chapter 7. In our next video lesson, we'll begin our studies in Chapter 8 with a consideration of the general types of lipids.